Hey everybody, welcome back. Clay Share Con day four. Can you believe we've already had four amazing days of pottery tutorials, demos, studio factory tours, Araku firing, so many fabulous classes on here and giveaways crazy um, but we still have all the rest of today and tomorrow so don't despair so right now we're going to do a melty mako glazing combos so i'll be using the stoneware line of glazes from mako and they are new to me as in i've only been using them for a year but you know what even though it's only been a year I tell you, they're so easy to use. It looks like I've been using them forever. You would not know that I've only been using these glazes for a year. Kevin's all right. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of my favorites before we get going. This right here is everything I will just say before we get started. Everything you're seeing is on Laguna B Mix Fire Decone 5 with no grog. So that's the clay I'm using. The clay you use will affect how your glazes look at the end. If you use a light, bright clay, your glazes will be brighter. If you use a deep, dark clay, your glazes could be deeper and richer. So it just depends what you're using. So the results I have are based on using B Mix Fire Decone 5. This is pink opal with Celadon Bloom on top. And then the very rim, I put light flux, and you can see how that light flux melted. Look at it melted. It's so yummy. So yummy. You love Mako glazes, Beth says. Yeah, I know. So this is a great bowl. We threw some bowls like this yesterday, and we altered them. But this is a, a similar bowl to what I was making yesterday. So I'll put that over there. Let me show you another really, <laughs> the inside of this bowl is everything. Look how gorgeous. Look how gorgeous that rim is is so good. I mean, the outside's nothing shabby either. That's not too bad. That's pretty nice. So this right here is Mako Lavender Mist. Three coats on the entire piece, and then muddy waters to about here, and then dark flux on the rim. That's what makes this happen inside. The dark flux does that. So yummy. Yeah, I did see that. Uh, well, actually, I talked to Mako. I saw the post, but I talked to Mako a couple weeks ago, and they told me ahead of time. They're like, we got new glazes coming, but they won't be out until after Clay Share Con because they wanted to send them to me. But I can't show them yet, but I think I'm going to get them a little sooner than some others. We'll just, we'll just wait and see. So this right here is my most simple combo and so easy to do. It's Celadon Bloom with Light Flux. That's it. The Celadon Bloom is amazing for making these blooming crystals. These are done just cone five. No fancy, no fancy crystal firing. It's really easy. And um, all the glazes I'm using are food safe. So I just want to put that out there because I get asked a lot. Do you have to worry about food safety? Well, you have to worry about it, but not with these glazes. <laughs> So let's see. So uh, new glazes coming out Monday. I know. See, that's the day after Clay Share Con ends. So I thought we would start. Oh, let me show you a couple others. Ah, uh, this. This is one of my favorite Mako combos. This one right here. That is Frosted Lemon with Blue Hydrangea in Light Flux. And the meltiness on that handle. That's so good, right? So, so nice. That's one of my favorites. I uh, want to keep it really simple. You could just do lavender mist with light flux. That's it. Just simple, simple, simple. Um, another really great one is blue opal with night moth on top. Kind of looks like Van Gogh's Starry Night we have going on there. Nice and melty. And then this one is Mako Pink Opal with galaxy on top and you get this like galaxy crystal blooming happening it's really really pretty so that one there is a really nice one too so we are going to do a couple combos and i got two bowls so we will we'll do that who you wouldn't have thought to put purple and yellow to, yellow together but it wasn't that bad no and if you um want little less purple try this combo this is the frosted lemon with a bit of blue hydrangea and light flux on the very rim. So you don't get too much of the purple overwhelming. And just so you can see, because I know people will want to see it, without the blue hydrangea, 
frosted lemon and no blue hydrangea right there on that cup. So you can see the difference, right? So it gives you your options. Little, little dark room, a little light melty room. It's your choice. We'll put that back. All right, so there's a ton of combos from Mako. They have so many great glazes. And we are going to start, we're going to do this bowl. And I kind of, I don't know, what do you guys think? You want to tell me a combo? And I'll do it. Blue Opal and Night Moth is your new favorite. And Blue Opal by itself is tough. It is. So I think, let's start with this little bowl. We'll do Blue Opal and Night Moth because that is beautiful, and I think this bowl will take it well. And then you'll tell me what you want me to do the big bowl, and we'll do the big bowl after. Well, we'll be working at the same time, because when you're glazing, you need to have more than one piece going at the same time, or else you're going to be waiting and waiting, and nobody wants to wait. So I'm just going to stack up some pieces out of the way. When you are glazing, you want to do yourself a favor, and... Move your bisqueware away from your glazing station because what tends to happen is you'll be brushing stuff on and you won't mean to, but you'll flick glaze onto pieces and then you'll have to scrub those pieces off. So I've just scooched all my stuff out of the way so I don't have to worry about having a glaze accident. So are, are all glazes only for stoneware, not for earthenware? No, not all glazes, but this happens to be Mako stoneware line. Now, you can use it on porcelain. It's just to cone five, cone six. Each glaze that's made is formulated to go to a specific temperature. So some glazes go to low fire, I think it's 0405. Some, some go to mid-range, which is cone five, cone six. Some go to cone 10. So it just depends what glaze you're using, and you need to know your glazes a little bit and know what they're for. Specifically, Mako stoneware glazes are meant to go to cone five or cone six. You can go to four and you can go to seven. There's always a little wiggle room, but your results might not be the typical or the results aren't the targeted results. So there's always a little wiggle room with those things. But this particular line is stoneware glaze line, but it does work on porcelain that fires to cone five and cone six as well. So don't let the name scare you off if you use porcelain. Can I talk more about the fluxes? You know what, I'll, I'll stop for a second and I'll grab the fluxes and we'll talk about them. I got, there's two kinds of fluxes that Mako makes. They have a light flux and a dark flux. The light flux is gonna go uh, almost cream color or it'll tint the glaze you put on it a little lighter shade of what that glaze is. The dark is like a gray color or it tints it a darker shade. For example, this Right here is the gray. This is the dark flux on the rim of lavender mist. So it went a grayer, so it grayed it down. Now, the light flux on lavender mist, see? Same glaze underneath, totally different effect, right? The light, this is the dark flux on muddy waters. See, so we see these little running bits. The dark is the dark flux. So it's called a flux, but it's a glaze. And it can be a little confusing if you know glaze chemistry like I do. And when I was first finding out about these Mako Flux products, I was like, but flux is part of a glaze. It's some, you know, an ingredient that makes it flux. It makes it melt. Forget about that. <laughs> Forget that. Think of it as a whole different creature, because it is. It's a flux glaze, which means it's a glaze that melts really, really easy and runs really easy. So these melt at a, at a lower temperature than the others that Mako has. And so they make everything else run. That's what's going on with them. And they come in the light and the dark. And you put them on top of anything. I put them on top of Amico glazes. I put them on all kinds of glazes. So you're not limited to a certain company's glaze. All right, so we said we were going to do blue opal, blue opal, and night moth. Oh, Kev, I'm going to need you to grab me night moth okay. when you get a chance. I don't think I have it. I got galaxy, and I didn't grab night moth. So this is okay. We're starting with the blue opal first. That's the muddy waters. So let's go ahead and open up our container. Hmm. Oh, that's way out. Let's fix that. So you have, let's see, Laguna. I lost the question. 
Cover glazing over texture. Um, we'll do, you know what, we'll do a textured piece. And we can talk about, oh, a cover. I am going to be glazing for textured pieces with, with Georgie's later. But um, let's see if I can do a small textured plate. I've got a plate we can do. So when you have texture on your pottery, you want that to stay, right? You don't want to lose your texture. And glazes come in two variables um, as far as like, like transparent or opaque. That's it. Two. It's either transparent or opaque. So you want a glaze that is transparent or slightly transparent. And what I've found that if you do one to two layers, not three, usually a lot of glazes can work on texture. But if you're not sure, you should always do a small test piece because you don't want to ruin your beautiful texture. Um, you know, look at these two pieces here and how beautiful they are. And this is the lem frosted lemon from Mako, and it works great just two layers. If you put three, it'll obscure. Now, the line of Celadon glazes that some companies make, like Amico has them, Clayscapes has them, um, those there, the Celadons are always great on texture because they're a translucent glaze. Even Mako has some Celadon glazes and they are great. I don't have any of them, but I've seen them on texture and they work fabulously. So for me, what I do is I try to find glazes that you might not normally think you can use on texture, but you can. So this right here is lavender mist, two coats on texture. You can still see the texture. The top, when you put multiple layers, it will obscure the, the texture, but that's part of what I like, is you have the area that's slightly obscured, and then you have the beautiful texture popping out. Okay, question for you. Yeah. Uh, Diane wants to know if you can put more glaze on the outside of the blue opal and night moth so that the glaze is a bit more smooth. If you fired it already, and it isn't smooth and you want to put more on to fire it again. I mean, you can, if that's what you're asking. I do three coats of the blue opal and I do, um, I think three coats of the night moth. And the night moth itself has almost a faceted effect. Like you'll feel it. It's not as smooth as the blue opal by itself. The night moth it's just the way that glaze is because of the crystals, but you can also try firing a little hotter. The hotter you go, the more it melts, but the more it will run. The um, night moth might also be on my table, but it might be on the wall. I might be out. That could happen. That would be bad. We would be changing this up, wouldn't we? This is a brand new container of blue opal because I used up my last when I was glazing. The last time we glazed with Mako that over there. All right, so let's start on this and I've got a brush. Just use some light flux. <laughs> if they ever discontinue it, you will be in a deep depression. I love the light flux. I'd been hearing about it for ages before I tried it. And once I tried it, I was like, what? Where has this been? This is, you, I'm like, people have been hiding stuff from me. I felt like I don't know. I felt like a kid when you learn about Santa for the first time. Like, what are you talking about? This has been around and no one told me. So I'm going to glaze. Thank you. You found it. All right, Ma. We got it. So I just want to address the going, putting another layer of glaze on. Um, actually, if you put too many layers, it's going to melt a lot more than you really want. So my suggestion really would be, if you don't have a smooth enough surface on the outside, I would suggest going a little hotter in your firing. That's really what I would do. That's your better option than putting on more and more layers because too many layers are gonna melt and run and then you could have crawling issues. Crawling is where the glaze pulls away from the surface because it's too thick. So we're just brushing it on with this fan brush. This is a Mako number eight fan brush. Um, I get mine from Clayscapes Pottery. They had a bunch back in stock because they sold out over the holidays. And I thank my mom. She sent me some for Christmas. Thank you, mom. So I got some more brushes because you can never have too many brushes. So this needs to sit until it's no longer wet. So I have to wait a little while. What would happen if you use both light and dark flux? You know what? I was thinking about that the other day. 
I think you would get a dark and then a light and they would run. I would do dark flux first and then light flux on top. I think that would look cool. I mean, I got some more pieces. If we can glaze in time, I'm completely open to doing that. We can do a combo and we can try that and see it, what happens. Aurora green and sandstone. I have not tried that. I use the, um, you know what's really nice, the Aurora green? Did I bring that? Oh yeah, it's green opal with the Aurora green on top. Look at that crazy combo. It's like peacock feathers. I did an iced tea set. This is actually an iced tea glass and I made a pitcher that I glazed in the same combo. So I have a set of really lovely iced tea glasses and cups that match. All right, let's do the inside now. So I did two coats of my first color on the outside and now we're gonna do the inside. So just pull this up. And I'm only going to do two coats on the outside. I don't think I want to do three. You can do three, but two looks really good. If this was a textured piece, I would certainly only do two because it would potentially obscure the texture. I made my mom this beautiful cup textured tumbler. Uh, I put the picture up yesterday for the textured tumbler, tumbler class. That was glazed in the blue opal and night moth combo. So do I prefer Mako to Amico? I do not. Nope, and we're going to be doing Amico later. So I use both Amico and Mako equally in my studio. I also use Clayscapes and my own glazes and Georgie's. So I, and look, I'm open to any other company's glaze. I am a, I, I'm an equal opportunity glaze user. I, I'll use anybody's glaze out there. Okay, we got another bowl that we can do something with. The Amico Texturizer, is that the same as the Mako Flux? I have never used the Amico Texturizer, so I can't tell you. Um, but if anybody out there has used it, chime in and let us know because I would like to know as well. I do believe people like to use the Amico Oatmeal, similar. So, and folks asking about Amico glazes, behind me I have some killer Amico glazes we'll be doing later. You'll get these fabulous results. So. Um, it, I don't just talk the talk, I walk the walk. I use the glazes and I show you how to use the glazes. So what are we going to do with this one here? Let's find out. Which do I put on first and how many coats of each? I'm seeing combos, so you're asking each other. Because the cone six glaze is also being refired and melted again, but not reaching maturity, you could always do a test and try. Exactly, that's a good suggestion for her. So what size banding wheel am I using? This is a Shimpo, and I believe they consider it their nine inch. It's really eight and three quarters inch. That's my favorite one. They, they're, they've been bought out by Nidec though. All right, we gotta glaze this with something, and if you don't tell me, I'm going to put pink, pink opal on it and sell it on Bloom. I'm just saying. And then we'll put a bunch of fluxes on top of that too. So if your glazes sometimes <laughs> Get on the lid and you can't open it. Little smack will get it there. Someone said sandstone, um, and what was the other one on it? I don't know if I have sandstone. The lavender and the flux. I know the lavender. We could do. We could do lavender. That's what <laughs> I grabbed. Lavender mist. Lisa, I must have been channeling you because <laughs> I grabbed the lavender. Um, you know what we'll do with the lavender? Oh, oh, we're going to do something awesome. We're going to do the lavender mist with the dark flux, then the light flux. Okay? Do you guys agree? Good. Sounds great to me, too. <laughs> That's the, I'm doing it. It's happening, sweetheart. So we're just brushing on. We'll do two good coats of lavender mist. Actually, this is a untextured bowl, so we can go ahead and do three coats if it was a a textured bowl, I would stop at two coats. This will be our fancy flux. You like that? Our fancy flux bowl. And normally when I'm doing this, I'll have little bats or little work boards to have my pieces on so that I don't have to. You know what? Kev, can you grab me a couple of the square plastic bats from Studio Pro Bats? Um, yeah, they're over with my bats probably to the far end of that row. Haha, <laughs> isn't it great to have somebody go fetch you stuff when you need it? 
my, my, is it a Sherpa? Yeah, yeah, I guess. So these are great because they're plastic and they're easy to clean. Let's see if we can grab the shit. Still a little wet. Now you could use a hair dryer in your studio if you don't want to wait and you could click that on and be like, Ooh, I don't have a hair dryer in my studio. So um, we'll clean this off and we'll start using the plastic bats. It'll make life easier. Will I repeat where I get the brushes? Sure. These come from clayscapespottery.com and they are Mako fan brushes. This one happens to be a number eight. I use the eight and the four the most. Hold on, get that out of the way. Those are my favorites. They do have a six, which is a nice middle of the road one. Mako has a six. I don't know if Clayscapes has any in stock, so that would be the, the big question. All right. So that's glazed on the outside, but we have to sit it away because we have to glaze the inside in a bit. We're going to let that set up. That was three coats on the outside. Uh, blue opal, you know what? Let's, let's put a third coat on the outside. I'll just do that because I really want to get a nice blue down here. I'm going to go not so far down with the night moth like I did on the cup. So we'll do that. That's the third coat. And then we'll grab that, flip it over. You would love to have a Kevin when you're glazing. Um, I don't have a Kevin when I'm glazing unless I'm filming. When I'm glazing by myself, like a normal glaze day, I have to be my own Kevin. It's very disappointing. <laughs> but he, uh, when we're filming uh, live, he's here. So I can be like, hey. But when it's just me, I have to go do it. All right, so that's it for the blue opal. I'm done with that. So I'm going to clean off my brush by wiping it and then swoosh it in my water. And then just squeeze out the brush. Now, to keep your brushes lasting a long time, you want to dry them at an angle down, if you can, or at least flat on something. Don't stand them up to dry. Water runs down into the ferrule and that can cause the glue or adhesive in there to loosen up and your ferrule could come off or worse yet, your bristles could come out. So there's a little brush care tip for you all. We got, we want to do some texture. Want to do a texture plate? Sure. So you use Amico texturizing and love it with ancient jasper. Creates a gloss and matte the same time. Ooh. Really? I'm interested in that. Need the front view to be larger instead of the small window um, off to the side so to show the examples. Yes, when I show the examples to the camera, we do need to make that front window big. And Kevin usually does catch that. Um, but I'm not showing anything to the front right now. So he can't hear what I'm saying uh, until it's delayed because he's got headset on. So what shall we do? Let's see what I've got that shows off texture really well. I have, you know, green opal does a nice job, but I don't have green opal around. I need someone to get it. <laughs> Any of the opal line that Mako has works really well on texture. And I do have a poster back here with their glazes on it. Um, and then after you grab that for me, my dear, do you mind getting me the Mako poster off of uh, the table? I'm going to show you all the Mako poster I got. Oh, other table back here. I put it on that table. You need that Justice Town rolling pin. I know. This, this is my newest rolling pin design, and it's, it's pretty awesome. So this is a Mako poster that shows their glazes fired to cone six. So they have their classic line, their matte line, their crystal line, and then gloss specialty and washes, and then their clears. So I got all that um, in the front, honey. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at their, uh, their, let me fix that. If you look at their classic line, that's where all the opals are. And so they have a turquoise, which I don't have, but I bet that would look amazing. Peacock, I don't have. Um, I do have. The, blue, the green opal though, so we can use that. I think we'll do that. I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of Mako glazes is what I'm trying to say. Mako, <laughs> he's sending me more glazes. No, 
I don't have a lot, so I can't do everything that I want to do, so I'm limited. But we can go ahead and do this, can't we? I know, thank you, Kevin. All right, we're gonna make this a bright green. Spring is coming, and it's gonna be perfect. Yeah. I get it? Yep. Good. All right, so I'm gonna put one coat of the green opal because on the very back where my signature is because I don't wanna obscure the black underglaze that's on there. It's actually a coat and a half, but I do want something there. I don't want it just plain. And, oh, let me get, let me get a bat. That would make it better. Okay. And so now we're going to go ahead and do the back side. I don't worry that I'm getting glaze on the foot. I wax the foot so it'll wipe off easy peasy. So I don't have to sit there and scrub the glaze away. So that was one coat. See, I kind of brush it on messy to begin with, and then I go back and smooth the whole thing. We're going to do a, a two coat here. This is why you wear an apron. I just flung it on me. Okay. Now take your sponge, and you can clean your foot up. Wax doesn't mean you don't have to wipe it off. It just means it's easy to wipe. You don't have to scrub it away. And I will check the bottom before I put it in the kiln for firing. And you always double check because you never know. You might have accidentally set it down on a glazed spot and then that could be on your foot. Okay, we're going to do two coats on this. So what do I think about the flux under or over? I like it over. I have done it both ways, um, but I really like the flux when you put it on top because I like that top layer melty. It still moves and melts. Now, I will tell you there's some cool effects you do when you put the flux on first, and it's just different. Um, you do little dots or circles of flux on your piece and then glaze on top and it does kind of a peacock eye sort of thing and um, I'll do some of that down the line. We'll, we'll do some of that peacock glazing. I know everybody loves that right now so we'll get that down the line for you all. So that's one coat of the green opal. Get in there and then let's do our edges. Just brush upwards. So what will happen to the, the black? The black will still be there. It'll, it'll be fine. But if I put three heavy coats on the black, it can tend to obscure it. That's all. It won't hurt it. It's just I carved my name in there and I won't be able to see it. So what I will end up now is if you imagine putting a green transparent film on top of black, you'll still be able to see what's under it. It's just the black will have a greenish tint to it. So that's what will happen to the black under there. But if I go too heavy, I could obscure some of it, and I don't want to do that. All right, so that was the sides. And let's do our second coat. And this is going to actually be a light coat. Because I don't want to lose the texture. And then I think uh, flux on the rim, or maybe some aurora. Maybe some aurora green. And then flux on top of the aurora because it's all about the flux today, isn't it? Or we could do, I wonder how Night Moth looks on Green Opal. Has anybody tried that? I mean, we're gonna be using Night Moth pretty soon. So that's the second coat on the front and I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure the sides have a second coat too. So that's it for the green opal. Let me just swish this brush out. Yeah, so this design is my newest rolling pin that I designed. It's called Jess's Town. I call it My Town because it's my town, you know? And it's a really great rolling pin you can get from SharonHoppyDesigns.com. 
and you want to go to the front and I will uh, I'll show everybody it. So I hand drew the entire thing and it's a village and our city. We have churches, we have fire stations, we have offices, we have galleries, we have parking garages, we have a city hall, we have you have what you want in there, you know. I didn't put Notre Dame in. It was it, there is a building that sort of is reminiscent of it, but it you know, my town probably wouldn't have Notre Dame in it. Although it's my town, I have whatever I want, right? So this right here is my my newest rolling pin design, and that's what I have on this plate right here. All right, so this needs to set up. Now let's go back to our other piece. This was the lavender mist, and we have done the outside. Now we're gonna flip it over and do the inside. The green opal fired, let me show you, I have a cup over here. It does look a bit like a chartreuse, yes. Here's a fire, do you wanna go to the front again? Mm -hmm. And I'll, see that green peeking out the bottom? You see that little bit of green right there? That's, and a little bit on the rim? That's what the green opal looks like by itself. It's a yellowy green. It looks very similar to what it looks like in the jar. L little less green intensity happening there, that's all. This is a, a, this bowl shape I call a bubble bowl because it's like a, like a bubble or like a fish bowl. So it's one coat, but we wanna, we're gonna put three on this one. And I already did the outside. Or did I? Did I do three on the outside? I think I did. You know what? We're just gonna put another on. You can put three to four. <laughs> There's no rules. Nobody's going to come and shut me down for adding an extra layer. It just might melt a little more, and or I run the risk of crawling, but I, th I think that'll be fine. I had a question for you about it, Blake. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, just bought Mako's winter wood glaze. Yes. Does it work well on texture? Um, I've not used it on texture myself personally. It's a more matte glaze, so I can't answer that exactly. But if anybody else out there has used it, let us know because I want to answer that. Yeah, and Mako does have a lot of combos on their website. If you go to makocolors.com, they have some really great innovative ideas. They also have a fabulous Instagram account. You follow them on there and they put a lot of good stuff up. So if you're looking for some good ideas for Mako combos. So this one is the same fan brush, the same number eight. This one's just a little one. This is a four. That's the difference. This is a tiny one. This is a big one. That's all. That's the only difference. Little versus big. And now this one's covered in glaze too, so. No, winter wood obscures texture. Okay, Karen, thank you. Karen just responded. Winter wood will obscure your texture. Thank you for that. I thought winter wood would obscure, but I hadn't used it. I have used winter wood. I didn't grab a piece. It has a lot of texture in itself as a glaze, so I would think you don't want to use that one, but um, you know, you never know. Sometimes things you don't expect to work will work. All right, so this we can sit to the side and let that dry and we can go back to our blue opal that we were going to put that night moth on. So let's grab our night moth glaze. Frank says winter wood would, would not complement texture. Yeah, it would compete too much. I think you're right. It's got a lot going on. So the glazes we've been using so far are their standard line, their classic line. And now we're going to move into using their crystal line of glazes. And these are all stoneware line, but they have subcategories. And so the crystal line actually has, I don't know if you can hear, you hear those? Those are little crystals in the jar as um, I'm stirring it up. If we go to the front camera, I will see if I can hold this up, if you can see the little bumps that are in there. Those gritty, bumpy bits are actual little crystal inclusions that are in here. And they melt and run and cause these beautiful uh, patterns that we get. So look at that. That's what we'll get with Night Moth on top of Blue Opal. And that's what we're gonna do here and now. So let's go ahead and do the outside, do a little housekeeping. 
wipe my bottom and for the for the outside if I'm just going to do the top probably going to do the top a little more than a third but not quite a half I'll just hold it by the foot um, you could turn it upside down and sit it on your bat if you want to that works too just clean that off a little bit the crystal lines are so much fun they really are you hear them you guys hear them well you'll see them you'll see them on the surface little gritty bits and glazing gets messy all right so i'm actually going to be glazing this first layer uh, it's going about halfway down the piece. Little melty. I dripped a bit inside. Just put a little bit, just a little on the rim. And see that little bit I got inside that I didn't mean to get? Gone. Not a problem. You won't even notice it once it's fired. Let me clean my sponge. So that's one coat with the night moth. Actually, don't think I need that other than the place to set it. And you can see, I don't know if you can see how it's running a little bit. It's a very melty, it's kind of thin, um, at least mine is, and it's kind of melty on its own. So we're gonna let this set for a minute, let you be. And now I think, Hmm, we could do the green opal one. What shall we do for the rim, you all? We could put the Aurora green on it. I have been disappointed a little bit sometimes with the Aurora green. Uh, so maybe we should do some fluxes. We could do a dark and light flux on this one too. We were talking about doing lots of fluxes. What do you guys think? Sometimes you use a spoon to get a few more crystals onto the glaze after the third coat, right? Because you can take them and kind of kind of, put those crystals on, right? You kind of plop them on. So I am switching brushes. I'm going to be using this brush. It's called the Sumi, S-U-M-I. I have lots of different ones. They look different. Basically, it's a bamboo handle with some kind of, uh, you see, like horse hair or some other natural hair in it, and they're used a lot in uh, Chinese and Japanese calligraphy. They're also used in printmaking a lot. So these are great for putting on the flux and for little detailed areas. And they're really inexpensive, and I've been using them for my whole life, basically, because when I was a kid, when I would do, um, I would do some sumi painting and, and stuff. So um, they're great. I use them for everything. So let's go with the dark flux going to stir this up and we're going to do the outside rim first. So I got a little glaze. I'm just going to smooth it with my finger. It's a little thick. I could have taken a clean dry brush and done that, but sometimes I just do whatever seems to come natural, right? All right, we'll go back to that later because that needs to dry. We'll do the outside first. So this is the dark flux. I want the dark flux to be a thicker band than I'm gonna do the light flux. So we're just gonna go in and I'm gonna come in um, a good half inch, I would say at least. And we're gonna go, this will obscure the texture, by the way. As this melts and runs, it will obscure the very edges. But that's part of it. That's part of what makes it so fabulous. And if you didn't want to obscure your texture, um, you know, there's other glaze options than this. This isn't the only thing to do. This is just what we're going to do right now. Let's see how this dark, I'll put two coats of the dark on and then we'll put mm, two coats of the light. <laughs> it's going to be interesting when we do this kiln opening. Your friend has only dip glazing and is hesitant to do more brush glaze. What tip do I have for the transition? You want to help her out with the brush on Mako glazes first. Yeah, um, I learned only dip and pour glazes. You know, I learned you had to make your own glaze and only dip and pour or spray, right? Um, and that's how I learned. But what I did is when I started, I just got a couple glazes that I knew I would like. I bought two pints and I used them and did some tests with smaller pieces and realized I liked the way they look, so I got a couple more. I actually started with Amico Celadons because that was an easy transition for me. But the Mako glazes, 
uh, Mako has so many beautiful glaze options too. So I would just look and see what colors she likes that Mako makes, if that's what you want her to go with or you want to help her. And I would just get a few and try them on a small piece, make a trinket dish or something, nothing big or fancy or that you're too invested in. So there's one coat, and that's going to have to sit a minute. Where can we go now? Our lavender mist is getting there. It's almost, almost dry. We're going to do the same combo on this. We're going to do the dark flux and the light flux on this as well. So I think I'll start on the, the inside. I think, I think we got enough in there. We're going to go, I'm actually going to do the dark flux on the inside, kind of far down. Um, about a little more than halfway down, I think. And I'm just going to paint this on in a band, and then I'm going to work my way up, and I'm just covering the whole thing in the flux. This will melt and run a lot. And for something like this, because we're covering such a large area, you might want to switch to a fan brush, but this little guy, it works. It does its job. Again, a little drip. I'm going to take care of that. Clean that out, no problem. If you clean it up as soon as you do it, it's not a problem. If you let it dry, then you might have to scrape. And I don't really want to scrape glaze if I can help it. Or add the dots of the light flux. Ooh, could do that. Yeah. Completed pieces with dark flux on it. Uh, I have to, I would have to go look around my studio. I don't know if I can get those for you today, but we can do more of that later. I can only have so many things out at my fingertips while I'm working. <laughs> Sadly, if I could, I would have everything for you guys. We're going to go further down with the dark flux on the outside. Um, there's no other glaze on here. There's nothing else on here. So let's go halfway down with the dark flux. I'm trying to think if I've got something. I do have a mug with dark flux and light flux. It has raspberry mist on it first and so it's a good example of one versus the other I don't know if Kevin can find those and I hate sending him out looking um, because my studio gallery is huge I have piles and piles of stuff like pots and stuff uh, from years and years 20 years of pots is a lot to have in a gallery so they're the pink ones it's the raspberry mist one is a spring bunny texture with a light flux on the top and the other it might be a mushroom texture with a dark flux so it's like a light melty top and a dark top they I can't remember if they're both the same shape I do believe they're both hand built mugs one is volumed out the other might not be all right so that's a good coat of the dark flux on the lavender mist and I went I went about halfway down I'm actually going to go and We'll see if Kevin can find those things. I'm going to do a little wiggle band here. Just wiggling my brush a little bit. This is the dark flux. So, and that's really what, if you, uh, this, you, you know, put it, thanks. Um, so this is the dark flux on raspberry mist. Raspberry mist is different than the pink opal I was showing earlier. And so you can see the dark flux, like I was telling you, it makes things grayer, slightly purpley, um, here's dark flux on lavender mist. So this is what we're going to be getting. So do you see how the dark flux is different on two different pieces? You see how it does vary depending on what your glaze is? And this is dark flux on top of muddy waters. So this is that running, that's muddy waters combined with dark flux. So that's what the two do. So basically dark flux looks different on almost every glaze. It, it's kind of cool like that and that's why it's really fun to you know play with it a bit and put it on different pots and um, I'm going to finish my little band I started doing here and to see what you get so what I'm doing and I'll show you close up in a second is as I'm brushing this on I'm kind of wiggling a little bit making waves instead of a straight line at the bottom I'm making a wavy line because a wavy line will dip and that's it he got it you're so good. You're so good. Thank you so much. Perfect. So good example. Raspberry mist on both of these cups. An example of texture might, might not be the best glaze for texture is, is raspberry mist. Do you see 
it's obscured the texture. This one here is dark flux. This one is light flux. So you can see how they are each a little different, right? So it, it's a huge difference between the two. I mean, you might love them both. If I was just gonna get one, I think I'd get the light flux myself personally because of my taste, but there's so many great pieces with the dark flux. It's sort of hard to be limited like that. All right, let's do the inside, the second layer. I'm only going a third of the way down with the dark flux. And I'm just gonna put a quick coat. I don't wanna go too thick on the inside. So it's a very thin second coat on the inside with the dark flux. And I really won't put um, hardly any light flux in there. All right, put that off to the side. Where can we go now? The night moth is drying. That first coat, am I in the front still? Can we put me on the front again? So that first coat I did, you can see how it actually ended up being almost two coats because the way I put it on, it was upside down, well, it was sideways. But as I flipped it over, another layer melted, like ran down. So I'm really, I did two, I already did two layers basically of the night moth on that. Um, but I am gonna do another one. So let's get back to this plate. Let's do a second dark flux on the rim. And I think what I'll do is I'll wait till this one is all the way dry and that's when I'll do the back. Although I might be able to flip it over. Let me see. Might be able to flip it over and just, yeah, let's, let's just do it now. So I'm just following the profile. This is my cloud rim template, also available from Sharon Hoppy Designs. Because it looks like a cloud, right? There, so a nice little line on the back, and then we'll just flip it. So once that dries, we'll hit it with some light flux. Let's go visit the night moth. Let's go see how night moth's doing. Gonna, you have to stir up these crystal glazes every time you use them. The chunky settle. <laughs> so what glaze um, is that uh, that lives in the little bobby pin book? The bubbly bits um, that I have here. The, this one here, which is the Aurora Green, is that the one? Or the Night Moth, which is this? Or the Galaxy? There's so many. Uh, tell me which cup in all uh, the blue, the pink, the green. <laughs> I see some folks are, they're light flux fanatics. I know. Um, once I tried it, it was like, that's it. I need to try light flux on my Orbe and my Spearmint and my own line of glazes. I've never tried it on, can you believe I've never tried the fluxes on any of my own glazes that I, that I developed? None of those glazes, which is crazy. I should be using it on that. All right, so that's the inside. I did another, another night moth layer. I'm just going to go in and make it a little... Uh, Pamela wants to know if there's any difference applying the flux under the glaze versus over it. It does make a difference. Yeah, you get a different look when you apply it under versus over. Mako has a lot of examples of that if you go to their website. And you can see it's makocolors.com. And they have a whole bunch of really great resources there. Ideas for glaze combos and everything. So we're just going to do the very rim here. I feel like... I feel like this night moth is, we've got a lot on it already. I don't think we have to do more than this glaze coat, which really is kind of its, kind of its third, but it'll be enough. Just wanna make sure, like I did with the dark flux, I'm, I'm just gonna lightly swoop, make swoops. The night moth will run a little bit too. And you don't have to put flux on it. You just leave it. 
Um, that's what I did with, with that piece there. We could put a flux on, though. Could. But you don't have to. So this is one of their, yeah, the Night Moth is one of their crystal glazes. So fluxes will be great on my cranberry. I think you're right. I think you're right. So where are we at? We can go back to the Lavender Mist now. Um, did we do all of our, our flux? Did we do enough dark flux? I think we did. Let's move on to the light flux because I want to get some of that on some pieces. So we can see a dark and light flux. So the light flux is like a cream color in the, in the canister, in the little jar. The fluxes are food safe. Yep, they are. And I think, nope, still too wet. I was going to try to pick that up. They are. Um, and when you put them on top of other food safe glazes, you should not have any issues at all with food safety. But, you know, something like a bowl, if you want to use a glaze that's technically not food safe on the outside, you can do that as long as you use a food safe glaze on the inside. That's why we always say when you're going to do lots of layering, you know, do all your layers on the outside and then the inside just keep it simple. I did put some dark flux on the inside, but that's all. That's all I'm going to do. Joanne says uh, light flux over your chun blue is beautiful. Did you do? You did that. That's right. Yes. Um, I need to do that. I need to write these things down, but the problem is I'm glazing, so I can't. <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> do you got a notepad? Light flux on my chun blue. I could ask Siri to take a note, but she'll mess everything up during the broadcast, so we can't do that. <laughs> That's what I normally do when I'm working. Um, I tell my phone to take a note for me. All right, that's the light flux on top of dark flux on top of lavender mist. I will take a before photo of this um, so that we have it. It was three coats of lavender mist. Um, no, actually, I think we only did two coats of lavender mist, two coats of dark flux, and one really thick coat of light flux. I don't think I'll put another coat on. I don't think it needs it. I think there's plenty going there. I went pretty thick. If you're doing thin coats, go ahead and do two. All right, so there's that one. Our Night Moth is done as well. That is three coats of Blue Opal and eh, three coats of the Night Moth. And we'll have to wait and see how that turns out. The only thing left for us to do is put the Light Flux on this plate. And we're gonna go a thinner line on the Light Flux so that the dark flux is there by itself, so it can stand alone. And we'll see what happens. This could come out terrible, could be spectacular. I do normally try to do this kind of thing on smaller pieces, and I recommend that for everybody. Do your tests on pieces you're not invested in. Celadon Bloom shows best when fired to cone five. That's what I go to with it, and I, I think you're right. Um, I think it stays bluer, right? It's just really pretty. It's a really pretty combo. A tiny layer of a color back on the rim. Ooh, yeah, of the lavender mist on the rim of the bowl. We, I still got it out. We could do that. I mean, I could do a little bit of the green on the very edge of the rim of this bowl. That would be fun. I never thought to go back and do that. We can. Why not? Let's see, how are we on time? We got, a, we got four minutes till, till I've got to go. So let's quickly put Lavender Mist on and then I'm gonna sign off. And we have a little studio tour we're gonna roll to after this. It's Yvonne, she sent us a really, really short, it's only a three minute studio tour. So we're gonna go and do that. Okay, I, may, I put this on kind of splotchy. We'll see what happens. It's going to melt in, do some stuff, kind of. Actually, I kind of splapped it on. <laughs> and I will probably put a little band of green. Actually, I think I'll leave this one. But let's go ahead. We're going to roll to Yvonne's now. I'll be back at, am I coming right back? No, Drew will be back at noon. Drew's going to be here. He's going to tell you what the best kiln for you is the best for your budget and the best for your pottery needs. And then after that, we're going to have Jeff from GR Pottery Forms at 115. He's going to be glazing and firing large pieces. I'll be back at 2.30.
for bringing out texture with Georgie's. And then we have Amico in a hand building tutorial. Of course, I'll be moderating all of the broadcasts. So when you're asking Jeff or, any, or Drew the questions, I'll be the one asking them of them. So thanks for hanging out with me and doing these fabulous melty. What is that going to look like? I don't know, but I'm excited. I kind of like how it looks right now. <laughs> all right, everyone. I'll see you all in a few minutes. You guys think Hi, of that. My name's Yvonne Morrow. I want to give you a quick tour of my favorite place, my basement studio. Um, I'll give you a, a little history. I'm just a potter for fun. I don't sell. I don't do anything like that. I used to go to community studios and then COVID hit. And so what was becoming, what was at that point to become my basement art studio switched to be a pottery studio. Now I have concrete floors so it's easy cleanup no problem i do have area rugs not rugs mats rubber mats for warmth it's cold up here in canada and for uh, comfort it's a little easier on the back on this wall i have my glazes they're all brush on glazes i haven't got into dip and pour at home here although i i think that'll be a natural progression just coming down this way um, I have my wheel and I use a, my bat system is a Freema bat system, which works very well. I, I just, I just recently purchased that. Um, I, after the Doug Peltman workshop, I, I did install the mirror above my wheel as he had recommended. And I have to say, it's great. It has really saved my back. I have recently had back surgery, so I'm pretty cautious. I water, I use the, you know, the three bucket system. Um, I get my water from just down the hall. There's a washroom or upstairs. We have a laundry room sink that has a glico trap to take away any, any kind of clay or anything. So that's kind of a, a real savior. Although I still take the slop and dump it out behind my husband's workshop. Uh, lots of storage. I have cupboards up there. Um, on this wall, I have put uh, a pegboard for some of my throwing tools or other tools. And I have this shelf system that is mostly for drying. Um, you know, it's sort of right now it's a lot of greenware because I haven't been able to get my kiln running. What I did do is buy a, a used kiln. It's a kiln setter kiln. It's hooked up in our garage. It's it's worked well. I keep my clay handy. Um, there's two different colors there, but I don't switch and without you know cleaning the whole studio. I have loads of buckets and pails and bags of reclaim. I don't know if that's a problem everybody has. I only use my reclaim for hand building. More buckets of water, as you can see. Um, on this wall, I have a couple trying to do this horizontally. A couple more big cabinets, lots of storage, uh, wear boards between them. There are my sloppy buckets. Um, here I have my slab roller, a Freema slab roller. It's fabulous. I absolutely love it. And I have above there um, a TV, which I have Roku, so I get to watch Clay Share whenever I want. And this sewing machine, which is seldom used, is, is very sturdy, so it's a great place to dry things. As you can see right now, I have stuff drying under plastic, and that, that works well. Um, and then moving along this wall, this cabinet is really the right height and very sturdy, and so I use that for um, wedging clay. Have the scale there to measure beside it there's just some hand building tools that i just bring over to the other table and again lots of storage and uh, oh yes i have things for grandchildren to do artwork too and then this table right in the center is where i tend to sit and do most things because i do have then a view of the uh of the tv watching clay share and uh that's that's it it's a tiny studio i think it's about 12 by 20 but it's, it does everything for me. It's all I need. And I hope you've enjoyed my tour. Thanks.